please welcome the founder of 37 Signals, Jason Fried. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Hello. Put my water down. So, how many people here are actually in the software business? Okay, you guys are really fucking lucky. All right? The software business is a great place to be. You can pretty much build anything that you want. You don't have to worry about you know, uh, physics. You don't have to worry about raw materials. All you really have to do is type. And I'm not suggesting that it's really easy to do. I'm just suggesting that it's not really that hard to do. You also don't have to worry about things like the cost of change. Changing is pretty simple to do in the software business. You can make a few changes and it doesn't cost that much, especially compared to people like in the house business or the hardware business where the change to a plumbing system or electrical system after you've launched is incredibly expensive and incredibly difficult. So you don't have to worry about stuff like that. And you can also build software anywhere. You can build software you know, um, in your house, you can build it at work, you can build it in a plane, inside, outside, hot, cold, doesn't really matter where you are, you can build software. So you're very, very, very lucky that you can do all of these things. But you also have to worry about some stuff that other people don't have to worry about. Software doesn't have the same kind of feedback that physical objects have. Like for example here, I've got this water bottle over here, and this water bottle is pretty obvious. So it's clear, so I can see through it, I can see how much water is in here. And the material that makes up the bottle is relatively light, so if it's heavy, I know it's full. And the top of the bottle is pretty easy to, to drink from, it's pretty big. So I think we could all agree that this is a pretty good design. But if this was twice as big, and if it was painted solid so I couldn't see in it, and the material was very heavy, I think we could all look at this pretty quickly and agree that this is actually bad design. It'd be terrible design if it was like that. So we can kind of look at an object and figure out if it's good or bad pretty quickly. This remote I have in my hand here, if there were buttons on the front and the back and the sides, and every time I held it, I pressed the wrong button, that would be a big problem too. And we would know pretty obviously and pretty quickly that it's bad design. There would be no question about it. But software doesn't have that sort of instant aha, I get it feedback. Software is too nebulous, it's too transparent in many ways, you don't actually see it. It doesn't have edges. It doesn't have weight. It doesn't have size or mass. You know, it doesn't cast shadows. Software is just there and it often expands and continues to expand and continues to expand and that's one of the things that makes it really bad. That's one of the really tough tricks of software development. So one of the things you can do is you can think about you know, what would your software be like if it was physical, if it was a physical device? So if it was something you could hold in your hand, you know, what would it feel like? You know, go look at your product, go look at your website. What would it feel like if it was physical? Was it, would it be spiky? Would it be comfortable? Would it fit in your hand nicely? Or would it be too big on one side and too small on the other? Would it be made of a nice texture so it doesn't fall out? Or would it be shiny and, and once you get sweaty, your hand would slide right out? If it was on a table, would it fall over? or would it stick up? What would happen if it was a physical device? That's definitely something you want to think about. And you can take it to another extreme, actually, and you can think to yourself, you know, what would it look like if it was a car? Would it look like this? This is what bad software would look like if you could see it. This is Homer's car, by the way, that he designed. When he wanted everything he wanted, this is what it came out to be. Um, so, the first version of a piece of software is generally pretty good. It's pretty clean, pretty easy, it's pretty focused. But software becomes pretty tricky once you get a few versions in. Version, version two is generally pretty good as well. Version three is a lot better. Four and five might be the best possible version of the software you'll ever write. That might be the glory time for software. But after that, software quickly devolves and turned into, it turns into something like this. This is what happens when you say yes to too many features. This is what happens when you say yes to all your customers. You end up eventually looking like this. So you have to work on avoiding that. And you know, a great way to think about this 
again, as I mentioned, is thinking about your product as if, if it was a physical device. But you also want to think about the responsibility you have, the discipline that you have to have to keep your product simple, clean, elegant, and streamlined. So you want to think about being sort of the, sort of the shepherd, sort of the, the gatekeeper. You want to think of yourself as an editor, as someone who decides what comes in, what goes out. You ultimately want to think of yourself as a curator. There it goes, we're missing an image. Anyway, uh, a curator. It says you are a curator on the screen. Just imagine that. Um, you want to be a curator. You have to decide what comes in, what goes out. A curator's job is to say no. That's what a curator does. They say no. And a curator basically takes the entire universe of options, and they decide whether or not these things are going to make it into the museum. And if you think about that, and you think about yourself as a curator, you can start to think about hanging your features on the wall, essentially. If you think about your product as a museum, you can think about the features as art, and you're in charge. And if you take all the possible features that exist out there in the world, or all the possible art, for example, and you take all the possible art and you put it into a room, it doesn't make that room a museum. What makes that room a museum is that there's a lot of stuff that's not on the walls. You know, all the art in the world in a single room is not a museum, it's a warehouse. It's not a museum. And you don't want your product to end up feeling like a warehouse, how it's just kind of everything to everybody. You have to be very, very careful about that. The other trick is to listen to your customers, of course, but you have to innovate on behalf of your entire customer base. Because what often happens is, is that certain customers will be very vocal, and as time goes on and on and on, they're going to be even more vocal, and they're going to either tell you that you, know, you have to add this stuff, or the product's going to, you know, they're, they're going to leave. They're not going to pay for your product. And you have to be very careful about agreeing to everything that the vocal minority says. Um, customers know a lot about what they want, but they don't know a lot about what's best for your actual product. So you have to keep that in mind, that you're not building for an individual. You're building for a group, a big mass of people who want to get certain things done. And if you listen to just a few people, you're going to have a problem. And if you add everything that everybody wants, you're going to have a problem, which is why you have to think of yourself as a curator. The other thing with software is that as it goes on, like I said, it's kind of pretty good in the beginning, gets a little bit messy in the middle. And as it goes on, you trend towards bloat. And bloat is a tricky thing to find. Again, back to what I was talking about initially, um, when you know, software doesn't have a form, so it's really hard to, to figure it out. It's really hard to look at it and go, this is right or this is wrong. But once you hit bloat, it's really hard to go back. Once you hit that point where there's too much in your product, it's really hard to go back. And oftentimes what companies will do is they'll end up building a new product. They'll start over or they'll rewrite it. And that's a really dangerous thing to do as well. You don't really want to get in that, in that loop because that's where you start to really have serious problems. So keep an eye out for bloat. Keep an eye out for all these feature requests. Listen to customers, but don't do everything that they say. You have to think of yourself as a curator. You have to think of yourself as someone in charge of a museum. You have to reject what doesn't fit, and you have to make your software basically a museum of careful decisions. Make it a collection, not a warehouse. I'll tell you a quick story about that, um, because it's not just about what your customers are telling you, it's about what you're also telling yourself. When we built our second product, our second major project, I should say, uh, second business product called High Rise, we had this idea that we would build this incredibly successful, big, huge, awesome product. We, it was like our sophomore follow-up. We had Basecamp first, and that was successful, and we wanted to do something even better the second time around. So we thought about all the possible things we could do with a CRM app. And what we found out was that we started building it, and it took about a month, two months in, three months in. We weren't even actually thinking about all the stuff we were trying to do. We were just doing it all. And then we finally stopped and started using it. And what we found was that it was pretty shitty. It wasn't at all what we thought it was going to be, because we kept adding more and adding more and adding more, and not using the stuff that we were adding along the way. So we didn't really have a good idea as to um, what the product should be until we started using it. Once we started using it, we realized that it wasn't very good. We had to throw it out and start over. And that's kind of a bad spot. You don't want to get in that spot. You especially don't want to get in that spot early, and you don't want to get in that spot late. But the biggest thing you have to think about initially, especially, is that the requests that come in 
form habits. So if you're going to start out early and you're going to think a lot about adding feature requests based on what people tell you, you're going to get into this bad habit of always saying yes. And once you set expectations of yes, it's really hard to turn back on those expectations. Excuse me. Um, we run into this all the time, too, where customers will request a feature. And they'll tell you they want one thing, but you have to really figure out what they really mean. Because customers are often only able to really represent what they know is possible, not what's ultimately possible, not what you can really actually do. So they might ask for, for example, a way to collaborate on comments on a message or a to-do list, for example, in Basecamp. But they're actually asking for something completely different. They just don't know how to actually enunciate it and explain it clearly. So you have to be the one who's going to take those requests in, reformulate them, and make sure that you're making the right decision again for the benefit of the entire customer base. One more uh, kind of story about this. When we were building Campfire, which is our real-time group chat product, we had this idea for all these things Campfire could ultimately do. It could be a you know, real-time chat tool, which it is, text-based. It could possibly have video conferencing. It could possibly have audio conferencing. It could possibly do a bunch of different things. And as we set forward to build it, we start thinking about what are all these things it could do, how could we add them. We start looking for other technology we could add. But what we actually ultimately needed was something that was much, much, much simpler than everything we could possibly dream up. And that's how we built Campfire, which is just simply a chat tool with text, not with video, not with audio. But if we would have listened to everything that we wanted to do and everything everyone else wanted it to do, it probably wouldn't have been built either, and it would have gotten bad over time, especially bad over time. It would have been harder to maintain and harder to make work. So what I really want to kind of leave you with here is I'm going to end a few minutes early, so maybe I can take some questions, even if that's not allowed. I'll take them anyway. Um, is when you get all these ideas that you have, that your customers have, you have to take them all, but you have to make choices. You have to say no to more things than you say yes. I was actually talking to Gary backstage, Gary Vaynerchuk, who's going to be up in a few, uh, few minutes. And I was asking him, he has a wine store, wine library. And I was asking, and it's huge, by the way. The wine library is enormous. I think it's like three floors or two floors. Huge. And I asked him, like, how many wines have you actually turned down? He's like, tens of thousands. They've turned down tens of thousands of wines. That's what makes Wine Library a good place. It's not that they have everything in the world. It's that they have a very specific curated collection. And that's what your software has to be, a curated collection of features, a curated collection of ideas, a curated collection of benefits. Not everything in the world, not all the benefits, not all the features, not all the possibilities, but a few solid possibilities, a few solid features that actually make your product unique and special. Just like a museum isn't great if it has everything, your product isn't great if it has everything either. Your product has to be a series of decisions, and you have to decide what makes it right. So I actually have two minutes. I don't know if anyone wants to ask me a quick question about this. There's like a lot of people here. Does anyone want to just raise their hand and ask anything about this, or are we done? Yes. What's the best way to politely turn down the feature creep in the company? Um, well, work is hard. So imaginary work is easy. It's easy to request this, that, and the other thing, but the real work is hard. So the people who ask for it, for ask for all these features, just ask them to build them. And <laughs> they'll be like, I'm not going to fucking do that. And then, you know, that's how you do it. Honestly, that's how you do it. Make them take responsibility for the requests. And also, you can also figure out, you know, attach costs to things. This is the other big thing that's important. You want to attach costs to things. So it's easy to say, let's do this, that, and the other thing. But if you start talking about costs, not only in terms of, of dollars, but in time and resources and the things that you can't do, it's pretty easy eventually for people to say, well, that would be great if we could do it, but it's actually quite expensive, so let's not do it. Yes? How would we redesign Microsoft Office? How would we redesign Microsoft Office? Um, <laughs> man. I wouldn't want that job, first of all. Uh, you know, Office is. It's fine. Office is fine as it is, actually. It's just what it is. I don't think it's really about redesigning Microsoft Office. I think it's more about thinking about what the modern office is about. The modern office isn't about spreadsheets anymore, and it's not about word processors anymore, and it's not about PowerPoint anymore. It's more about collaboration. So if I was to redo Office or get involved in that project, which thank God I'm not, um, I would definitely think about making it more collaborative and less about the traditional sort of office suite of things. 30 seconds. Anything else? Yes? Who should be the chief curator? Was that the question? Who should be the chief curator? It's got to be, well, first of all, everyone has to have that in them. 
Gary also talks a lot about the idea of your own personal DNA. The DNA of your company has to be about curation. It has to be about saying no. But ultimately, it has to, I believe it has to come from the top. I mean, you know, I hate, you know, everyone wants to cite Apple as a great example, but Steve Jobs is probably the ultimate curator in the business world, period. There's no one even close to him. And I think it shows in his products. So I'm actually out of time. Thanks very much for listening.